Greetings in the wonderful name of our resurrected Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, where we're excited about getting ready to fellowship in the Word of God. It's Wednesday in the Word. It's time for us to look at what God is speaking to the church through these prophetic books that we're going through. They often call the minor prophets, not because they are of any lesser value than Isaiah or Jeremiah, but because of the length of their particular writings. Well, we're excited about it. Thank you for always coming together to fellowship in the Word with me. I appreciate you being connected to the Word, and thank you for uh, being obedient to the Spirit of God. I believe it's the Holy Spirit that reminds us of those spiritual things in our life that we are to attend to because He's here to help us, and He knows our heart is set upon the things of God and upon the kingdom of God, and He's there to bring things to our remembrance that pertains to the Word of God. God and pertains to the will of God, and we know it's God's will for us to fellowship in his word. Well, we're going to pray, and we're going to go right into our prophetic books. Father, we honor you for this day that you made. We honor you for the time that you've given us here on the earth, Father, so that we may be able to magnify your name in the land. Thank you for being the God who rules and reigns in heaven and earth. Thank you for being the God who has all power, all, all authority, all dominion. And thank you for being our God, that we trust in this living God, who lives and dwells in us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask now, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you will speak to each of our hearts, Father. You will continue to build and des uh, desire on the inside of our hearts for the things of the kingdom, for the things that bring glory to you on this earth. So we thank you now, Father, for giving us an understanding heart, giving us spiritual insight in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're talking about awakening to God's love. Being fully aware that regardless of what is happening in our world today, God is at work. He is doing a work that no man or no woman can stop. And our eyes are set up on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as we keep our eyes up on him, the Bible lets us know that we'll be able to stay encouraged. We'll be able to stay mentally strong, spiritually strong. We'll be able to stay focused even in the time of suffering because Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews 12 and 2, he is the author and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith. Well, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, we witness here God speaking to this particular prophet by these angels here in chapter 3 that are, that's given revelation to him concerning what God is doing uh, with his covenant people, Israel, Judah, and with Jerusalem as these prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, has been assigned by God to go back and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and to rebuild that great worship temple temple so that his people can get back on course with the will of God for their lives. As I stated previously, these prophetic books, they have immediate uh, focus and they also have a focus that is in the future. Some of these things that are being said uh, makes reference to the millennial age, makes reference to the Messiah's coming, and we have to know how to make that shift and know how to identify that. Also, these particular books primarily speaks to Jerusalem, it speaks to Israel and Judah, but we know that due to the Holy Spirit that's in our heart, in the Word of God, we're able to make spiritual applications on certain things that are revealed even under this old covenant. Therefore, as we continue to walk aside these particular prophets, as they continue to share with us what God spoke through them during that rebuilding, during that revitalization of God's covenant people in the land that he called them into, we're going to begin in Zechariah chapter 3. So in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 3, verse number 1 begins like this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. I call this the real enemy. This fourth fourth vision opens with Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, while Satan stands at his right hand, prepared to accuse him. 
and perhaps one of the things that Satan or one of those fiery darts that he's throwing at Joshua is that fiery dart is that you don't qualify. You are not good enough. How can God use you? Look at your life. Look at what you have done. Look at what you are doing. You see, Satan is the one who comes to accuse and to discourage us when God has called us to his divine service. And whatever that looks like in our life, we don't get to pick and choose as some people often do. They look at what other people are doing and then the flesh sit there and say, well, I can do that. Well, I, you know, but are you called to do that? Are you anointed to do that? You know, so often in the body of Christ, that spirit of the world, as I said, that's what we have to contend with more than anything. It's the spirit of the world that influenced that system of the world, that kingdom of the world coming over and it bringing influence within the church. And so instead of us looking at Jesus Christ being the head of the church and everyone else align themselves behind the Lord Jesus Christ, we got to get out of line and try to get in front of somebody else. In the name of the Lord, call me. Well, I believe we're all going to give an account, as we know the scripture says, for what we have done in this earth. And it's very important that we recognize that when God has put a divine calling on our life, and I believe he's got a calling on all our lives. We're the one that put certain labels that make certain callings feel more important than others. But we got to realize that if God call you to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, you should rejoice. If God call you to be a teacher, if God call you to work with children, if God call you to work with young people, to mentor them, to sow into them the word of God so God can always have an army ready to carry out his will, Whatever it is, if God called you to be a part of, you know, serving others in different capacity, just be faithful and be humble in that. No matter where you're serving, if you're serving God, the enemy, Satan, is going to do exactly what we find right here, the angel revealing that he's standing there to oppose Joshua. Well, you know, David had this experience in Psalms 109, and I'm going to turn there quickly. In Psalms 109, David had to deal with this because when Satan opposes us, we got to remember he will use spirits and he will use people who are willing to yield to those spirits. And sometimes he'll use people who have gotten close to us. And that's what happened with David. So listen to Psalms 109, beginning at number verse one, David's testimony. The scripture says, do not keep silent, O God of my praise. So what he's doing, he's praying to God. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceiver. Notice the two mouths, the wicked and the deceiver. We know Satan is the wicked one, but he deceived people. So he said, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceiver have opened against me. Notice the mouth, what they're doing. They're, they're saying things. They're speaking evil. They're telling lies. They're trying to discredit David. They're trying to, it's what we say in the church, they're putting their mouth on God's anointed. And when that happens, that is a great opportunity to not say, I need to confront them, but first you get in the face of God. You begin to pray. Because God is going to deal with that unclean spirit working in that person. He goes on to say, they have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred. You know, when you got hatred in your heart, when you got a grudge in your heart, can nothing good come out of your mouth toward that person. Somebody can come up and tell you something great. Oh, glory to God. I tell you what, Pastor Curley, he's a great blessing. He's preaching that word. Man, I don't know much about that man, but that word is coming. And then all of a sudden, if he's talking to the wrong person that got the wrong spirit, they're getting vexed right now. They're getting upset in their spirit because there's what? Somebody speaking good. Somebody speaking blessings over an anointed vessel of God. But when hatred is in that person's heart that's listening, they're going to go in their toolbox of unforgiveness. Hallelujah. They're going to go in their toolbox of a grudge or anger and say, let me tell you what he did to me. Hallelujah. Well, let's go on. And then he said, and, 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 and they have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In other words, David said, I didn't do none of these people. 
It's because of what? Deceitfulness in their heart. That's why they're doing it. And sometimes I've seen Christians say, well, you know, uh, and sometimes it's family members. They come, well, I didn't do anything and I don't know. You got to know that's a spirit you're dealing with. You got to know that you can go there and try to reason with that spirit. That spirit don't have an a, 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 a attitude of a heart, of agreement, of coming together, settling a matter, matter. That's an evil spirit. You can't even meet with people, demonic groups. I've seen people like that. You know, you got little demonic groups within the church, not in word or lie. We don't have that issue, but I'm saying in some churches, you have these little, little factions, these little groups of, I call them demonic groups, or they're formed by the devil. And a lot of time it's the fight against the will of, the, of, of God for that church. A lot of time it's the fight against the move of the Holy Ghost in that church because they want traditions to run the church. They want to run the church, and, and a lot of it is fear. They're fearful. They're fearful of their position. They're fearful of their false sense of power. And so when they see evangelism start being uh, uh, preached in that church and saints are going out reaching people for Christ and they're coming to the church, they're, they, they are, they're afraid. They're afraid of losing their influence. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they want to meet with the preacher. You don't meet with a demonic group. Hallelujah. You keep doing what God called you to do. You keep praying. You keep fasting. You keep fighting that thing in the spirit and watch what God will do. He will bring glory to his name. He will bring edification to those who are receiving that word and he will promote you when evil try to come against you. Hallelujah. But I want to give that word. That's a word of encouragement to someone to let not the weapons of your warfare be carnal that you use but use the spiritual weapons as David is, and you begin to pray. You begin to pray. And then in verse four, he said, in return, now notice this, notice how they're treating him. But notice what David said, in return for my love, they are my accusers. In other words, all I did was try to walk in love with them. And as I sold love to them, what they became, my accuser. Who are they working for? Satan. That's why I call them demonic groups. They're working for the devil. They're trying to find a fault in the man of God. They're trying to find some to discredit him. All right, then say, but I have give, but I give myself to prayer. That's how you respond. David gave himself to prayer. You don't let that grudge get in your heart. You don't sit there and try to negotiate with those spirits. You begin to pray and ask God, God, show me what to do. And ask God, do he want you to meet? God may tell you, no, do not meet. God may say, meet, but bring this person with you. Whatever the case, you're going to let prayer be the guide of your heart. You're not going in fear. You're not going worrying about your position. Because I tell you what, if anybody can get rid of you, that's the will of God for your life and you need to rejoice. If anybody can vote you out, you need to stand up and celebrate and rejoice knowing God, I know that you've allowed this to happen because you're trying to get me somewhere and glory to God, it took this for you to get me free from this bondage. All right, then he said, thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Well, so we see then David is showing us that he sowed the right kinds of seed. In verse six, he said, set a wicked man over him and let an accuser stand at his right side. That's what the enemy does. That's what Satan does. And that's what he's doing right here in the case with this vision that Zachariah is seeing relative to Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right side. And the Bible specifically said to oppose him, to be his adversary, to accuse him. And in Revelations chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible say, I, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God, in the power of of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night so I told you Satan is the accuser but he has to find what he has to find willing vessels that will allow him to sow that spirit in and they become deceived and they don't even realize themselves that they are being used by the devil because the Bible say Satan is an accuser of the brethren. Those who are in God's family, those who are in covenant with God, Satan comes to oppose him. 
That's why we have to recognize that if God has called us to a divine service, if God has commissioned us for a work, we're not standing on our titles. We're not even standing on, well, I heard the prophet tell me that God called me to do this and my mother told me and my dad. No, no, you're not standing on that. You're standing on the word of God. You're standing on the fact that God has put an anointing on my life and no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every tongue that rise up against me in judgment is already condemned. And this is my heritage. This is my inheritance. This is my right as a covenant child of God. I tell you why a weapon cannot prosper against you because you are anointed by God. Hallelujah. And if you're in Christ, you are under that anointing. Hallelujah. And Acts 10 38, it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. That anointing is the spirit of God and the power of God in the Bible say who went about doing good, destroying all the work of the devil, healing people. Why was he able to do it? Because of the Holy Ghost. And because of that anointing of power upon Jesus' life. And if Jesus is the head of your life, the oil that is upon Jesus, the anointing that is upon Jesus, it comes down upon the body of Christ. We are anointed to do the will of God in the earth. And then in verse 2, he goes on with this fourth vision. And the Lord said to Satan, oh, glory to God. Thank God that he recognized that unclean spirit, that devil trying to oppose his people and trying to oppose his work. And God speaks to Satan. The Bible says, and the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? I call this delivered for destiny. The Lord rebukes Satan and affirms his continual devotion to Jerusalem, who is represented here by Joshua. The picture of the branch plucked from the fire is symbolic of God's covenant people being delivered out of Babylonian captivity and sent on an assignment to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple. Boy, I believe we need to have a revelation here. God don't deliver us for destructive living, but God delivers us so that we can fulfill the destiny that God has called us to in the earth. And in that destiny, there is something that we are called to do that's going to bring glory to God and that's going to enrich or edify the lives of those in the body of Christ. Sometimes you see people who claim to have callings and have nothing to do with bringing glory to God. It has nothing to do with enriching people's lives. It has nothing to do with magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God is letting Satan know you cannot, you will not, you will not oppose Jerusalem. You will not oppose my covenant people. And Joshua here, he stands as a symbol that represents God's covenant people of Jerusalem. Now, remember I said this, this, this text is making reference to Israel, Judah, and Jerusalem. And when you're rightly handling the word of God, you won't go and, as I said, try to pull things out of the Old Testament as I ministered on Sunday, how we go in that old covenant in Leviticus 16 and we look at the priesthood and we look at the garments of Aaron and all that and we bring that over in the New Testament. And people start putting all this type of order in the church with all of this garment and attires and having these ceremonies and call people getting promoted and all this stuff. Man, we got to get out of that stuff. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't come here and teach us in the New Testament how to have all that kind of uh, activity in the church. Matter of fact, he came in the church. He ran out all of that carnal stuff. And he said, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer. In other words, it's a spiritual temple now. It's not about this material stuff. It's not about these, these elements and things of that nature. 
It's about the power of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God anointing us so we can reach the harvest for the kingdom of God. And listen, listen, you don't have to have a garment on to go tell somebody about the gospel of the love of God through the, uh, Jesus Christ. You don't have to be called to a certain position to go out and share the, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need a title for that. No, you don't need a title for that. You just need to have the word of God hidden in your heart so that you can give an account or give it a response to every man who asks you concerning the hope that is within you. And we're to do it with gentleness and respect, according to the apostle Peter. Well, you know, I thought about this as we go into make a spiritual application here. Again, as I said, this text is making reference to Israel, Judah and what's going on in Jerusalem. God's covenant people under that Old Testament. But there is a spiritual uh, application that we can see here, and that is this, that God, when he sends deliverance, he sends deliverance so that we can fulfill destiny, so we can carry out his will in earth. And I believe a great New Testament example, a model of that is in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul. So take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Some of us are familiar with the testimony of the Apostle Paul or the witness of his conversion. But I want you to listen to this because we see here that God, when he brings deliverance, listen, listen, we be talking about people getting delivered. Well, when you get delivered, you got to put something in the house. You got to get in the word of God. If not, the scripture reveals that when Satan goes out of a, uh, out of a vessel and he's cast out, when he's driven out with the power of God's word and prayer, that Jesus said uh, that becomes what? That becomes a clean vessel. But if you don't put something in it, those unclean spirits will come back. And they'll say, let us go back to our house. And they come with seven more spirits, more powerful than themselves. What they're trying to do? They want to occupy. But thank God that when the spirit of God is on the inside of your heart and you are being filled with the knowledge of God's word, with sound doctrine, those unclean spirits, they cannot come back. Why? Because there is no vacancy. It's all filled up with the power of God. It's all filled up with the word of God. It's all filled up with prayer. It's filled up with praise. Hallelujah. It's filled up with reading and meditating the word of God. There is no vacancy. Hallelujah. Well, in Acts chapter 9, I want you to journey with me here and we make an application here relative to what deliverance looked like. I said that God delivers us for destiny, not for destructive living. The scripture says, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. What he's doing? He's out to persecute the church. Who's using him? Satan. Yes, he's working for the devil and don't even know it. He's deceived. Yes, he's deceived and he's coming against the church. Hallelujah. Not the synagogue because he goes to the high priest. He come against the people on the way. The people who have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2 and on fire for God and going, and going out everywhere, spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders. That's what he's trying to stop. He's not trying to stop religion in the world. He's trying to stop the radical anointing of God's people that's on fire for God and going out telling everybody that Jesus saved, that he was dead, but he's alive and he lived forevermore. That this same Jesus that they crucified has risen from the dead. And the only way you can be saved is through repentance and faith in his name. Well, it goes on in verse two and asks letters are from him to the synagogue. So he asked letter permission from the high priest to go to the synagogue of Damascus so that if he found any who were of the way, you see that the people of the way, the Lord's way. Jesus said, I am, I am the way, the truth and the light. No man can come to the father but me, but by me, they were called the people of the way. Hallelujah. Walking in the ways of God. Walking in the will of God, carrying out the works of God, the people of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Oh, glory to God. Boy, that's deliverance. The light, the glory of God. While he's out to do evil, while he's out to do wickedness, God has a call on this man's life. And now heaven is responding to God's word. And the Bible says in verse four, then he fell to the ground 
and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is talking directly to Saul. Saul did not recognize that he was fighting against Jesus. And a lot of times when Satan have deceived people, they don't realize they're fighting against Jesus. They're fighting against the will of God. They're fighting against a move of God. They're fighting against a work of God. And now Jesus confronts him and asks him, why are you fighting against me? He thought he was fighting against the people on the way. He thought he was fighting against the people that were having a great influence on the religious system of that day. People were leaving the religious system and they were running and following Jesus. Hallelujah. And people will do that. They'll come out of tradition. They'll come out of that bondage. They'll come out of them dead songs and all that deadness. And they'll say, man, I went to this place and the power of God and the spirit of God and there was joy. There was peace. There was rejoicing. I'm going where there is a lifeline. And that lifeline is is the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is given the freedom in the church, people who are seeking God will know that this is where the Spirit of God is at work. And he goes on to say, and he said in verse 5, who are you, Lord? I notice how he responded. Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuted. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. In other words, you can't win. You can't, you can't have no success when you're fighting against Jesus. And then in verse 6, so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's how, that's how you respond to deliverance. You say, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm ready. I got a revelation of who you are, Jesus. I got a revelation that, this, that, that, that the Spirit of the Lord is at work. I got a revelation that I'm trying to fight against the will of God. And I'm humbling myself, and now I want to be a part of that. And then he goes on. Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Man, what humility now. What humility, this great leader who's on the, on the go to work against the church, now got to humble himself and depend on somebody else to guide him. But you know what he's doing? He's seeking the will of God. In nine, verse 9, it says this, And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. In verse 10, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said, In a vision, Ananias, he said, Here am I, Lord. You see how God works in the covenant family? These renegade people go out doing things and don't have no accountability. God said, yeah, I got a call on this uh, man's life, but I got also someone I've already called and already been using, and I'm going to speak to them so they can go and minister to this man that I have called for a work. So he speaks to Ananias, a man of faith, a man of God, a servant of the Lord. In verse 11, so the Lord said to him, arise, go to the street called Straight." and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. Hallelujah. What he's doing, he's doing something spiritual now. He's praying. He's seeking God. We are delivered for destiny. And a lot of time when people get delivered, they don't take time to, number one, humble themselves. Number two, to begin to seek God and wait on God. Number three, to submit to spiritual authority or leadership in the church. They don't want to do that. They just want to get up and say, oh, God called me to do something. No, in this, in this deliverance, we see humility. We see patience. We see a, a desire to seek God. We see, what well, a person praying. We see what a person submitting to Ananias, God's servant. I believe that if God had called Paul to say, I want you to go and serve my servants by preparing the animals for them to travel. I want you to go and serve my servants so that you can carry their equipment while they go out and do the work. That Paul would have had the same zeal, same motivation, same joy, same peace as he did being called to be a missionary because that's what God called him to do, to be a missionary, to carry out 
the will and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's deliverance not only resulted in repentance and salvation, but a humility and a willingness to do whatever the Lord assigned him to do. He actually just said, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Hallelujah. He didn't look at what he wanted to do. He didn't look at what others may have been doing in leadership. He looked at Jesus and simply said, what is it that you want me to do? Listen to Jude, verse 20 through 23. He said, but you, beloved, building up yourselves, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt, save others by snatching them out of the fire, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by their flesh. God, in a sense, he snatched Paul out of the fire. In a sense, he, he, it was so radical. It was such a, a, a sudden move of God on this man's life. It was such a powerful transformation to take place. Powerful testimony that the Apostle Paul shares throughout the epistles concerning this experience that he had on the road to Damascus. Not to exalt himself, but to give glory to God. And when we are ministering to others, there are times that the Lord will lead you to to, to, to be patient with them, to, to show the love of God, to, 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 to minister his love before them. And there are times that God will intensify that zeal in your heart. And it's literally like you will come with such a radical word of faith, a radical word of evangelism, a radical word from God to just snatch them out of the fire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And sometimes that is what they need. They need a strong word. Sometimes they need a strong word of rebuke that's going to snatch them out of the fire. Why? So that God can deliver them so that they can walk in the destiny that God has for their lives. Boy, I tell you what, Zachariah, he's in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing for the glory of God. And we get to witness this in this fourth vision that he prepares for us. And I'm not going to rush this. I'm taking, I'm taking our time and hallelujah. I want us to eat slow. Sometimes in the natural people eat fast and somebody may tell them, you know, you eat too fast. Your food don't digest well when you eat too fast. Eat slow and enjoy the meal. Hallelujah. But I want us to enjoy this spiritual insight that God has given us here through his word. And I just have one faith question I want to share before we close. And that faith question is this, how in realizing Jesus' role as your intercessor, as well as the one who is rebuking Satan, accusation toward your sin and his means of trying to discourage you in serving in God's work, encouraging your faith. That's what Satan does. He, he opposes us. Yes. The Bible tells us that we've got to resist him in the faith. Yes. And so as, as knowing that Jesus is, is your intercessor and Jesus is the one who prays in your behalf and Jesus is the one who stops Satan from thinking that his accusation and, and his oppression and his works can discourage you and stop you. How does that encourage your faith? I believe it really encourages your faith because you know right now, glory to God, even when things don't seem like they're working, trust me, God is at work. If you're praying, if you're in the will of God, God is working. And so your faith is not in what the enemy is doing. Your faith is not talking about how busy the devil is. Your faith is not up there talking about every time I try to do something, the devil tried to stop me. The devil is a defeated foe. He's already been defeated. And Jesus is interceding for you. And Jesus, like he told Joshua, he, he, uh, the scripture said, and the Lord rebuked Satan. God is still rebuking Satan when he's trying to accuse uh, we that are in the body of Christ. 
Psalms 103 even tells us that God has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. But as the heavens are higher than earth, so is his love toward them that fear him. Man, God has given us mercy. The Bible says it is because of God's mercy that we have not been consumed. Great is his faithfulness. I want to encourage someone today. And I'm not encouraging us to go out and live contrary to the will of God, but I want to encourage us to know that if we do sin, we have an advocate, hallelujah, Jesus Christ, the Holy One. Yes, he plead our case. He, he is the mediator of this covenant. We don't go to a priest, we go to Jesus. And he forgives us of all of our sins. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Well, I want to thank you for journeying with me. We're going to get back in this word, the Lord, the Lord is willing, next week and continue as this fourth vision because there's more that Zechariah is going to unfold to us and hear what God is speaking, not only during this time, but also how that is applicable for us today as New Testament blood-washed believers. Well, I want to remind you there are other uh, avenues that you can go and receive spiritual enrichment through the ministry of Word Alive Church here. And one of them on Sunday evenings at 815 um, 96.1 FM, uh, I'll be ministering uh, during that time. So every Sunday evening at 8.15 p.m., uh, you can get Word Alive broadcast on FM 96.1. And then also Monday through Friday, man, there's nothing like getting a word to encourage your faith through the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we're on the Worship and Word Network work, uh, broadcast from on, on 105.1 FM. So if you're at work and you can listen to the radio, put it on uh, uh, 105.1 FM and we're coming on at 1 o'clock to 1.30, a word from God to encourage your faith, to keep you being enriched and edified in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then right now you're being able to feast on Wednesday here on Facebook and YouTube at 7 p.m. We're ministering the word of God. And man, on Sunday morning, we are coming together in person. Even though we have Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Uh, teaching on uh, Facebook and YouTube, but we also have in-person gathering on Sunday morning. Yes, we've been coming together over a year and a half now. Someone asked me the day about when we were going to open up. I said, we've been open up about a year and a half now. And I want to encourage you, if you can come with us, join us on Sunday morning at uh, 9.30. We have time of prayer. We're in prayer. Uh, how we're preparing the house through prayer. A prayer ministry along with myself. We're out here praying. And then at uh, 10 a.m. we go right in worship. Hallelujah. Just enjoying the worship and praise and ad just adoring God in our worship. And then we hear the word of God. And then we just go out and live it out and be a light to the world. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me for this time of Wednesday in the Word.